So let's talk about the state of data science and data science job in Australia from a recruiter's perspective. I'm Samanve, a data scientist living in Sydney, Australia. Today, I've got the pleasure of having Emily Nota on the channel. Emily is a senior principal recruitment consultant at Precision Sourcing, a recruitment firm based in Sydney, Australia. Welcome, Emily. Why don't you start off by telling us a little bit about what got you into the recruitment game and tell us a little bit about your background. Cool. Absolutely. So as you can tell from my accent, I'm from New Zealand, born and raised Kiwi. I moved over here oh God, close to nine years ago now. And I've got a big family back home, oldest of five kids. So I feel like I'm older than I than I look or feel like I'm older than I look, I think. But um, I suppose for me, the reason why I moved over here, a lot of my friends were here and I just thought, look, I did uni, I finished it. I sort of, said, sort of thought, okay, what do I do next? And then Australia was the next best thing because we could become PR, which is pretty exciting and actually quite rare to default Amazing. PR, which is cool. Mm. And then I sort of fell into recruitment. Everyone sees that line and I know it's overused, but I genuinely did. I just, I was working at Lululemon as a manager for the sales floor and I thought, I'm just going to have a look at Seek. And I, I found a job on Seek. It was a recruitment job, obviously, the one before Precision. And that led me to Precision, obviously. And Precision is amazing, quite simply. I've been here just over five and a half years now. And our slogan or tagline you'll see on our website is we all help talent achieve. We are really different in the market. I think for a couple of reasons. One, we don't just place people on seats and call the phone all the time and uh, sorry call people on the phone all the time and just you know put the phone down and it's like a transaction it's absolutely not like that we run a lot of events to engage with our community in a different way which is similar to what you're doing which is awesome so for example we run a networking group called women in data which is for obvious reasons it happens quarterly obviously pre-covid because we've had some challenges with being in person and they're different topics each time some of them can be workshops hosted by managing directors of accenture and you're actually hacking at a real life problem and presenting back other things are like how you can engage effectively with stakeholders we run a podcast called keeping up with data which whoever's watching should definitely follow <laughs> with industry leaders on it and it's quite a fun sort of way to engage with other people and then we also run hackathons which are usually with sports like NRL and Cricket Australia so for me that's really important because I like to engage with people differently and I'm definitely not a transaction person and I like to believe in people that I place and it obviously gives me the I suppose the subject matter from learning from you guys as data analysts and data scientists in a real life setting rather than just like chatting on the phone. Great to know a little bit more about what you guys are doing at Precision Sourcing. So I'd like to kick off with a couple of questions about just recruitment in Australia in general and more so the data science industry. Why don't you start off by telling us a little bit about, um, you know, what excites you about the data science industry in Australia, and then we can go a little bit into, you know, the demand for data professionals, etc. Good question. I remember vividly before I got an offer from Precision, I got an offer from a construction recruitment uh, oh, consultancy, wow. <laughs> and I was umming and ahhing between tech and construction, and I was like, God, which one do I take? And one of my deciding factors was quite simply the industry. It's constantly changing and evolving, yep. and it's also like an industry that people are so passionate about what they do. Yep. So that's what, what really excites me about data science, because it's constantly evolving, and then, yeah, everyone loves what they do. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think that's something I've also noticed in kind of the STEM landscape is everyone actually loves working there <laughs> and it's actually that it's nice to just go to work and everyone's passionate about what they actually do what would you say the demand is like for kind of data professionals in australia and how does that look going into the future such a big question i don't want to put my foot in it because we're talking about like data and people might quote me on numbers but <laughs> like it's quite simply and generically it's like huge demand for people there's a lack of talent obviously because a million or more people left the country pre-covid haven't come back as well we thought there'd be more dribs and drabs but there hasn't been and i think it's probably because the other side of the world has started to gear up again and they're kind of like oh maybe we will stay and you know, whatever. But um, I think the good thing for the people in this particular industry is that I would say it's the, one of the industries that are relatively recession proof, hence why we've kind of seen the industry continue to grow through COVID and then absolutely like knock it out of the park in the last year. So perfect for someone who's, I suppose, looking at the moment. What would you say in this kind of increasing data science market, what would you say are like the most 
common roles that you're kind of recruiting for? God, so many examples being data scientists that can build a capability from like sort of like a greenfield capability because everyone's noticed that they need data science after they've done all the engineering piece. Customer insights leaders, people who've got, got like SQL, Tableau, um, who can really push back and talk to the business and influence in a room. Could you uh, break down that role a little bit more, the customer insights analyst? Is that similar to a data analyst? It's very similar. There's a fine line. So it depends on what the client really needs this person to be like doing on a day-to-day. But typically what we do is break it down into like tools and then also what they're going to be I suppose looking at it a day-to-day basis so the customer okay. insights analyst or lead yep. is someone who's going to be using SQL day-to-day most likely they're going to have to do the cleansing wrangling manipulating you know data munging piece but then they're mm. also going to have to pull out what the insights would be from that data and by insights I mean like actionable things that could potentially add value to the business and then they'll go in and say okay Tableau we need to visualize it present it to different audiences um, that might be sales that might be mm. product that might be marketing that might be your own data people but you need to be able to tailor your approach for dashboards and and also interpreting those insights to different audiences and then i suppose recommendations and make changes awesome so you mentioned a little bit about the data scientists being in demand customer insights analyst Uh, what about more the engineering type data professions like machine learning engineering or data engineering? Yeah, I think those two, I think data engineering actually trumped data scientists in our last survey, which was like obvious as well, because in our minds, it's like, we've noticed a lot of the market is like, okay, our engineering environment's actually not up to scratch. We can't Mm, do all the data science work. So let's reinvest and go back and find data engineers. Obviously, they're a lot more expensive now because there are few of them naturally um, before even COVID. So huge demand. Machine learning ops is going to come through the ranks as one of the more exciting job titles Mm. to explore, I think. Diving a little bit deeper as to specific advice for candidates looking for data jobs, because a lot of my audience is fresh graduates from university after their master's looking for data jobs. What do recruiters typically look for in a candidate? when they're kind of trying to place them in a data job? Great question. And I'm so glad to speak to this because it will help so many people. And I know people get frustrated on the other end as well as recruiters. So (laughs) I think it's someone who knows what value they've added in their experience, who can clearly articulate their achievements, have a well thought out CV and layout that's legible, easy to follow. And then also someone who's really transparent and upfront with what other opportunities they've got on or where they're interviewing. Because I think a common theme and this is probably because the recruitment industry didn't have a very good name years ago is that people in the market like to work against recruiters not with us Mm -hmm. so actually being able to work with like recruiter as an extension of yourself and a partner is really key so that transparency and honesty is absolutely key and then you know someone who's maybe not been in the industry for long who you know would think oh god like achievements what have I done I've only been in an internship three months or something like think about what tangible outcomes you have delivered and if it isn't something that's like you know I've decreased fraud by 10%, Mm. that's fine. Like it just Mm. needs to be something that you can explain articulately and clearly. So actionable achievements that you kind of delivered. And, you know, I get a lot of questions about whether GPA or your grade in your master's degree matters. And my kind of answer to that always is, you know, your sales skills and your ability to present yourself matters so much more than than your grades. What what are your thoughts on that? 100% agree. I don't think I have ever had a client, maybe one client, because it was like actuarial actually. So oh, they needed good. a specific average um, from their grades. Right. But God, the amount of people that I've worked with outside of that is ridiculous. And they never ask for grades. They never look at them. It is definitely what you've just said, how you yeah. can articulate and sell yourself as a person or professional on the market awesome. without overselling yourself, of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You don't want to be overconfident or try to make it seem as though you know something you don't actually. I think. Employers are pretty allergic and they're pretty good at spotting that in the first place, right? So would you have any specific advice for candidates looking for, you know, jobs as a data scientist or a machine learning engineer? I was kind of going to blanket this one with a bit of a 
everyone needs to think of this piece of advice, but I can go into detail. So I think for everyone who's a data professional, engineering, science, analytics, you name it, one piece of advice for this particular market is that there are a lot of options out there. And I think it's really important to tread carefully and cautiously and read between the lines and don't let it get to your head because at some point the market will turn. And it's not to say that, you know, it's going to absolutely crash because I think these roles are really crucial to a lot of businesses now. And they know that. We saw that through COVID, right? Everyone invested in data. So it's just about reading between the lines, like I say, making sure you know really what you want out of your next role and are not just chasing the dollars. That's something that will come with your experience. Because I find like in um, data science, there's a lot of mismatch between mm. people's ambitions and what they actually want to work for. And they get swayed into roles which might not suit their personality necessarily. Yeah. And they realize that after a couple of months and then they're out there looking for another job again. I know I constantly see that now, especially in the last sort of six to 12 months, because there has been a lot of shift um, in roles in the market mm -hmm. recently. Um, so yeah, and I think maybe that might come down to actually the person who's interviewing, asking the right questions and not yep. just like saying, oh, okay, they kind of answered that, but shy yep. away from answer, asking it again. If you don't have the answer, don't be mm. afraid to ask again, because yep. that will be key, you know? And at the yep. end of the day, tenure in a role where you can like show value, like we talked about, yep. it's massive. Yeah, it's really a candidate's kind of market here, right? And it's it, it makes sense for both parties to be surveying that, that compatibility, right? And it's not just like a one-way street. Yeah, because at the moment it probably feels like that, but it, it will like balance out or, you know, it'll catapult the other way or whatever. Yep. So you want to make sure your relationships are um, intact as well for when that might come yep. around. I guess the hot question, how are salaries looking in this kind of landscape for data professionals in today's environment? Oh, the golden question. So I got a few facts here for you from our data talent survey. So only 2% of the market in Australia and New Zealand are earning under 80K. There was a doubling in those earning over 250K from last year's talent survey. 63% of the market are earning above 150K versus 43% last year. Big Amazing. Jump. And then starting salaries in the data market have massively increased. So only 5% with less than two years experience are earning less than 80K. That just tells it's you how good. much it's shifting. Yeah. <laughs> and it's yeah. looking good. Uh, so I just want to switch gears a little bit and talk a bit more to international students because a large part of my audience is international students. Have you placed any candidates that ha have been international students to a sponsorship or whatever that looks like? I hate to say it, but I actually haven't in such a long time. It was a lot more common when I started in Precision, which was yep. five or so years ago. And I think that's just to do with the sentiment between like visas, immigration and, mm. and companies. It lot, it's a lot harder and a lot bigger investment for those companies too. It's yeah shifted to less and I think it is a harder market for international students to get into as well, especially if you've not got a visa. Are there any specific companies that come to mind that these students should be applying for? Because in my head, there's only massive companies that actually have the capacity for doing this visa sponsorship, right? Like I wouldn't expect any small startup to be able to sponsor anyone. Yeah, I wouldn't know off the top of my head, but I do know that most of the employers that can do that have to be accredited. So they're like on a right. list for the government to yep. basically look to and say, okay, fast track this for this visa or fast track this sponsorship. So actually a good example is not someone who's massive, but Airtasker, yep. they're on that list. So okay. if, and they're not like a startup, but they're not, you know, huge. There's like 250 people or something. So yeah, yep. it's, it's, a, it's not just the big corporates like Westpac yep. and CBA and stuff like that. Gotcha. So my recommendation is look, Look, look to see if there's that list online yeah. in the government. And try Maybe we'll and find dig that it. up somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's all good. I'll leave the link to it um, in the description once I've found it, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> Next up, I'd love to get your insights on, you know, do you place any, like a lot of candidates with a Master of Data Science degree? I actually am noticing it a lot more. Like I've seen, no one really asked me to find people who have Masters of Data Science or anything. It's it's not really about education when they get yep. a brief, but I have seen probably the last five people that I've spoken to, three of them had a Master of Data Science, which is quite like oh, wow. strong. Yeah. Yep. I mean, I don't know if that was just a like luck of the draw, but yeah, yeah I was noticing it a lot yeah. more. I guess it seems like the, it's like a natural transition for people to pivot into 
data science these days, right? Exactly. Like a lot of those people might have been, I don't know, say BI developer or an architect oh, yeah. and they're like, or even just like a, a marketing person that oh, wanted wow. to transition into data. Yep. And they're like, maybe I'll just do a data science degree because I'm really interested in the data world and I've mm. been trying to get my hands on it when I'm in my agency, if they're in a marketing agency or whatever. Wow. Yep. And so it's actually a real selling point to clients because then they're like, okay, cool. I see that they're upskilling in their own time mm -hmm. and it's it's Amazing. really cool that they've got that, for example, the marketing person, they can talk yep. to the business and different types of teams, brand, product, all that kind of thing, but then add their data flair. Well. Right. You're seeing a lot of mid-career transitioners that are leveraging their domain expertise from their previous life and then bringing yep. that and mixing that with the data expertise to be valuable. Yeah. And it's also like a really good tip actually for someone who is like maybe in your audience that yep. is a mature student that is mm. wanting to transition into that career mo like move. Yep. It's good to like hone in on if you come out of a supply chain role and you're an operations lead or something, yep. go and look at supply chain for your like internship or your yep. new role or whatever, because you, you're going to be a great addition to the team, yep. obviously, because you've got that subject matter expert. So do you have any tips for what kind of organizations new grads should join? Like one of my recent videos was kind of looking at startups versus established companies versus large corporates. So where do you think is the best place for like a new grad to be starting their career? Uh, first of all, like look at all the grad programs that run so many times a year. And like, I know the bigger corporates like KPMGs and, you know, PWCs, EYs, I, I would say if I was a grad, I'd be looking at consulting if I could, because it's always good to be a generalist yep. before you then like specialize. Right. Um, there's actually one of the podcasts that we ran with um, Shira Saga, who was head of data at Iconic and mm. now at DoorDash. He was saying the exact same thing. He was like, look, I was Amazing. a generalist and then you just yep. narrow it down. So short answer really is like, there's no one company that you should be looking at. You should be looking at all and just mm. taking sort of what experience you could get to get in the door and go from there. Cool. That's good to know. And do you have any networking tips for new grads? <laughs> Yes, definitely. We run a, obviously that women in data group. So I would recommend following us on LinkedIn okay. precision sourcing. Awesome. We've got a lot of those types of events that they can come along to, and there'll be leaders in the industry that are there that they can network with and potentially they'll have an internship Fantastic. or whatever. You know, web analytics Wednesdays I've heard is really good. Meetup.com has a lot of options and a huge audience as well. And everyone's quite engaged on yeah. that platform as well, which is yep. cool. Our data jams, we often have one a year and that's obviously the hackathon that I mentioned earlier. We use Usually have like a miscellaneous team that joins so if you wanted to get your hands dirty in some data like cricket data jam for example mm -hmm. is insane because you've got to yep. work with all of the cricket australia team that's and present back to them fantastic. it's pretty yeah. cool especially yeah. if you're a grad right because then you oh, put that on your cv that's solid yeah <laughs> yeah I had a, um, a client who worked for one of the big tech companies and he was yeah. like, oh, if they don't have like, you know, depth of experience in commercial industry, I look straight at their GitHub or I look straight at yep. all the like projects that they're working on. And I'm like, I don't, he's like, I don't care if they're not got the experience that, yeah. you know, five years, the job description says, cause that's, yep doesn't matter like if they show the initiative and they show that they're keen and passionate and are doing it in their own time because they really want to get up and running and you know into the market that is yep. a really good sign of a good attitude hmm. so yeah amazing that's good to know and uh, the next question i was going to ask was um just around mid-career transitioners in today's so you've you've touched on it uh, a little bit uh, but i'd love for you to expand a little bit about what is the percentage of mid-career transitions that you're really placing into jobs versus like new grads can't give you a percentage because people are going to like drill me if I'm wrong. That's all right. <laughs> um, but look, I'd love to be doing it more because I think that's a real untapped market and yep. people who um, are transitioning should get in touch with me or the team at Precision because we got, often get clients that say, oh yeah, of course I'll, I'll entertain that conversation or I'd like to meet them if you know they're brilliant in, like I said, supply chain or yeah. Um, they worked in property and they're wanting to be an analyst for domain group or something. So we, we can always help. And if it's a case of us saying, look, we can't represent you right now because of, I don't know, the, the requirements really specific. And we just, if we sent you, they wouldn't in interview you, but we can help you with like CVs and like fine tuning those things, interview tips, all those things that maybe we, you'd expect us to not do unless we represent oh, cool. you. It's not the yeah. case. That's a great tip actually. So hopefully some of the audience will definitely hit you up for that. So just a final question. I think you just mentioned that. Um, how can precision sourcing help our viewers? So many ways. So 
like obviously the the LinkedIn piece that I've mentioned as well we we are really active on LinkedIn we're constantly sharing content that might be personal to us it might be you know something that is about what we're doing day to day with our work it might be something that's value adding to you as a yeah. job seeker yeah like follow us and that hopefully will help you with understanding the Australian and New Zealand market for data obviously for us reach out via LinkedIn because we can definitely like help you no matter what if it's like I say if it's tips or if it's just like go in this direction here or there we can't help you right now but we will eventually then that's also fine so don't be afraid to message and then yeah get involved with our events because the events are so valuable like we run even talent like survey webinars or quarterly report webinars which talk through the market every every quarter so that will give you a good flavor for what's going on what's changed and all that kind of stuff and then what else would I say I'll just get your name out there get a get a brand going build your own LinkedIn profile and make sure it's visible to others because like that could be picked up by anyone you know and fantastic places. That's some solid advice right there. Thanks a lot, Emily, for coming onto the channel and talking to all of our viewers about recruitment in data science in Australia. Oh, thanks for having me. Reach out, obviously, anyone who's watching, if you want any tips or tricks and have a chat. Awesome. Yeah, Emily's a bit of an influencer on LinkedIn as well. I think <laughs> I checked, I think you had nearly 13,000 followers. So quite the reach out there, so, which is Gosh. great. <laughs> so definitely hit her up uh, she'll definitely accept your follow hopefully <laughs> i will and uh you're a bit of an influencer yourself too so more the creator i guess rather than influencer <laughs> content <Great>. creator <laughs> content creator <laughs> great thanks a lot for your time emily really appreciate no it